Thank you, everybody. I want to start with a little story. Well, this morning, I woke up and uh, opened the blinds and looked into my neighbor's yard and saw it was full of cats. And immediately, I wanted to know, why is this happening? So, thank you for coming to my talk. My talk is about practical probabilistic programming with cats. And we have three goals. I want to explain to you what probabilistic programming is, and I'm assuming that you don't have a background in machine learning, but you do have a background in functional programming. So we're going to be addressing it from the point of view of somebody who um, is into the FP stuff, but not so into the, um, the sort of machine learning side of things. I want to show you that all of your favorite functional programming tricks apply. In fact, this is a very relevant thing for functional programming people to get into. And I also want to explain why all these damn cats are in the yard. So let's get into that. So step one is science. The first thing you do in a problem like this is you try to build some kind of, of model, which is explaining the prevalence of cats. So when I looked into my neighbor's yard, I saw they were leaving things out to entice the cats into the yard. Sometimes they were leaving milkshakes out, which brings all the cats to the yard. Sometimes they were leaving out stinky, stinky fish. And sometimes they were just leaving out nothing. Right? And then we're leaving them out with equal proportion. They quite like putting that milkshake out 60% of the time, or probably 0.6, there's a milkshake there. 10% of the time it was fish, because you know fish smells a bit, to be honest. And 30% uh, of the time it was just nothing. So this gives us a probability distribution. And if we were to write this in a sort of a scholarly Cody type of sense, we might say the type is something like this: a distribution over the enticement. So um, that's the kind of type we have. Now, this model on its own is not sufficient. What we need to do is look at the effect the enticement has on the cats showing up in the yard. So a milkshake is a pretty hot thing if you're a cat. And 70% of the time, that brought three cats to the yard. 20% of the time, two cats. 10% of the time, just one cat. Fish is pretty popular with cats as well. Not quite as popular as milkshake. But you can see he's got a 40% of two cats, 40% of three cats, 20% of one cat. And nothing, well, it didn't bring the cats out with such frequency, but the cats still quite like hanging out there. So, uh, you know, there's still a pretty good chance of finding a cat. Right, now when we analyze this, what can we say this is, what is going on here um, from a sort of a coding point of view? From the machine learning or the sort of statistician point of view, we say we've got a conditional probability distribution. But in terms that is more useful to us, what we could say is we have some kind of function. Right, we've got a function which is going from an enticement to a distribution over cats. So let's just go back to one of these. You can think of this as a function. Uh, you give me an enticement. Here are a particular instance of enticement, nothing. Or it could be fish, or it could be milkshake. And then I'm getting a probability distribution back over the cats. Right. So we have something like this. I have a distribution over enticement. I have some functions going from enticement to distribution over cats, and I, get it, I want to get distribution over cats out of the end. Can somebody tell me how to combine these two things? Anyone in the audience? What, what, what should I replace with triple question marks to make this equation work? Flat map, thank you, right. I was a bit worried there for a moment. Okay, flat map. So this is flat map, and this tells us that there is a mon monad for a probability. And this is... The, uh, the most important thing that I want you to take away from this talk. There is a monad for probability, which means you can take probability distributions and you can apply all of your favorite functional programming tricks with monads to them. And away we go. Uh, sort of a challenge question. If the monad, you know, flat map represents conditional probability, what does the applicative represent? Anyone like to take a punt on that? You don't have to. This, I'm not actually expecting anyone to answer this. Oh, good. Independence, yes. That's great. Okay, so the particular to join together two events without any dependency between them is representing independent events or independent distributions. We've seen the model here. We, we, we've seen how you might build a, a probability model explaining some phenomena, in this case the prevalence of cats in the yard, and we've seen that the structure of this model is effectively it's a monad. Okay, now I want to turn to the engineering issues, which are going to look at how can we actually implement this to answer some kind of queries of interest. So an example of the type of query I might be interested in is um, 
given there are three cats in the yard, what is the probability that they put out a milkshake to attract those cats? Because that milkshake's really damn good. I want to go and get some if it's out there. So how, how would we answer this? Well, uh, firstly, again, if you're familiar with stats, that's the type of notation they would use, but it means the same thing. If we had some kind of distribution over enticement and cats, then we could basically, in a way, read this, out, read this off. We sort of say, we can enumerate all the different possibilities. You could think of how you might solve this bit on paper. You would probably have some kind of decision tree. Enumerate the possibilities, and then do a little bit of um, arithmetic to work out the probability of interest. OK. So for a small, discrete problem, we can solve this exactly. And let me show you an example of how we would do so. Um, here. Hope that comes up. All right. OK. So here's a basic model. I was just encoding what I described earlier in Scala. And um, hopefully, it's be quite simple. We have an algebraic data type describing the possible entice enticements, uh, milkshake, fish, or nothing. So we can't use nothing as the actual name because that collides with nothing in Scala. Um, same for, for cats. We have one cat, two cats, or three cats. We have a very simple, discrete problem here. You know, in a more complex thing, you might hand a distribution over cats, which is continuous, and some sort of queuing theory set up. But we're keeping things simple. Um, and then we're defining a, uh, a distribution here over the enticement. And there's just a, a little thing um, which I'll talk about. This is called enumeration in my model because we have a distribution type, which is for a more general situation, where we consider problems that are not just discrete. So just for implementation reasons, this is called enumeration here. It means the same thing as what I've used distribution earlier. So distribution over enticement, and it's got exactly the structure we saw before. We're saying that uh, we milkshake with probability 0.6, fish with probability 0.1, and nothing with probability 0.3. And then um, we have our distribution over in the enticement and the cats. And again, exactly the structure as we saw earlier. It's a flat map. And then for each of the cases, we return our new distribution. OK. Let's uh, pop into the SPT shell. And um, well, I already got up there, but pull it up again. This is the type of thing we get out. It's, it's not very easy to read right now like this, but hopefully you can see what's going on. So we've all the possibilities here. Milkshake, one cat. Milkshake, two cats. Milkshake, three cats, and so on. And the probability associated with each of those events. And the way we combine probabilities is the way that you would expect if you've done this type of stuff in, in high school, I, I imagine. All right. So what we're interested in is uh, the probability of there being milkshake, given that there are three cats. So we need to filter out all the possibilities uh, and give us just the, the possibilities where there are three cats. Which we can do like so. Let's get these events and filter them for three cats. And we have that here. And uh, so we end up with. So we can see um, the probability of milkshake in three cats is 0.42. Fish in three cats is 0.04. And nothing in three cats is 0.03. Notice that these don't sum up to one at the moment. Um, so if we want to actually get the, the true probability of the milkshake being three cats, we need to have 0.42 divided by 0.42 plus 0.04 plus 0.03, just adding up the total probability mass we have there. And we see the probability is about 0.85. So 85% chance if I see three cats, there's a milkshake in the yard. I've been hopped out there and grabbed some milkshake for myself. All right. So that's um, a pretty simple model. It shows us the main structure that we're interested in. Um, building a model using conditional probability, and then using this model to answer some questions of interest. So based on something kind of I can observe, in this case, the presence of cats in the yard, what is the probability associated with something I cannot observe, the presence of milkshake? It's a very typical thing you want to do. All right, going back to our presentation. Right, so as we saw, we can solve this type of problem exactly. That's great. But this won't hold for all types of problems. Um, there's a combinatorial explosion, the more discrete events we have. So for large discrete problems, we'll run into issues. 
And of course, for continuous problems, uh, we're definitely going to run into issues because we can't enumerate all possibilities. And even though computers, of course, have discrete numbers, we can't enumerate all possibilities there either in a reasonable amount of memory. So uh, in the, the general case, you need some kind of approximate solution. And this is really where we get into the more interesting um, case and the real application of probabilistic programming. Because people have been able to solve these type of simple problems I showed earlier. You have to do those for a long time. You probably did them in high school. Um, and it's really much more complex models where we want to lean on the computer more. So approximate solutions, what, what do they look like? Um, one way of solving things approximately in a sort of general sense is to do sampling instead of doing um, the enumeration. So what I'm going to do is instead of enumerating all the possibilities, I'll just sample from the distribution and get a bunch of samples which will represent, hopefully, with reasonable accuracy, the, the distribution of interest. Now, <clears throat> I could use the type of model I had before and just push through a bunch of samples down the model. So when I flat map it, I, I'm just like, have a sample and I'm pushing that down. Maybe I'm going to have like 10 samples, 100 samples, I don't know. But it's, it's much better to really decouple these. Um, decouple the description of the model, which we saw in terms of the flat map and so on, from the sampling process. And there are a couple of good reasons for doing that. One good reason is you can interactively choose the number of samples. If you have a very simple problem like the one we had here, you probably don't need that many samples. If you have a very complicated problem, um, you probably need a lot of samples, and you'll be able to you'll want to choose that interactively. You might sort of grab a hundred samples or a thousand samples, see how long it takes, see what kind of um, distribution you've got, and then uh, maybe ask for another you know, bunch of samples. Maybe you sort of test your model first, and then you push it out to the, the cluster to grind over it for um, a couple of days and produce a few million samples, so you get some decent accuracy. Um, the other important reason is that the sampling method, you want to tailor it to the problem. Um, again, this is not a talk for statistician machine learning people, so you just have to take my word for it that there is a big area of research to uh, creating different sampling algorithms, and different algorithms have different suitabilities for, you know, for different problems. So though there are general purpose algorithms, you can often get nice improvements um, by using a sort of algorithm that's tailored to the problem at hand. So it'd be nice if you could sort of choose your own sampling algorithm. Right, so this idea of separating the description of the model from the sampling process is uh, an instance of a more general idea, which we might call separating the abstract syntax tree from the interpreter. And um, if you've watched, say, Runar's talks or uh, other things, and you would have seen this idea of def defining a algebra and an interpreter for the algebra, as a very common pattern in functional programming. And here we have a sort of algebra which has our monad structure, and we want to define an interpreter for it, which is a sampling. And this tells us if we kind of reify the monad as an abstract syntax tree, we're going to get the free monad. Oh, happy days, right? So our favorite little FP tool, the free monad, is, is lurking in here waiting for us. Now, I, I don't want to go over the free monad, because um, that would be a talk in itself, and I've only got about uh, 10, 15 minutes left. So you just have to take my word for it that you can basically represent uh, this stuff as a free monad. If you know what the free monad is, then hopefully you can see this. If you're not so familiar with the free monad, then you can just imagine you know, what defines a monad. It has flat map, it has point. You basically just create case classes, create a case class called flat map, which has the parameters that flat map takes, create a case class called point. You don't actually create a case class called flat map for efficiency reasons. That's a whole bunch of stuff I don't want to get into. You can conceptually think of it as being that. So you're really just saying, taking the functions and turning them into data. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll show you an, an example of, well, in fact, you, you don't need to do this yourself. You just pull it from cats is, is the main thing. Then once we have that, sampling is just an interpreter for the free monad in the usual way that you write uh, these interpreters for the free monad. So let's see a, a, just a little example of that. 
So you can see sort of how trivial this is. Um, oops, I forgot to make that bigger. Okay, so this is all just leaning on cats. I said here, a distribution is a free, free monad uh, with a generator type, and the generator is the primitive probability distributions, um, like a discrete distribution, or Poisson distribution, or a normal distribution, which we then glue together with these conditional probabilities and so on. And that, so we have this uh, definition here, giving a type. We have this definition of um, the the generator type, the kind of primitive probability distributions, and there's a little bit of goofiness going on in here, which is explained by the comment, but not really that important. And then we have, um, to sample from it, we just have a little interpreter, which is defined here. So we have a, our interpreter transforms a, um, a distribution into a function from nothing to some value of type A, given a source of randomness, a Java util random. And the interpreter itself, you can see, is it's almost nothing going on in here. It's extremely easy to write this code. What it says is, give me a generator. A generator is something I can sample from, and sample from it. That's what we do. And then the, the free monitor takes care of all the, the flat mappy bits, etc. That's all done for us. So you really have to do virtually nothing to get this working, which is fantastic. Very simple. OK. So let me just say, one of the great things, as I said, you, with this setup, you, you can substitute in different interpreters. I had a very simple one there. You might want to do things in parallel. You might want to do things over your big data cluster. You know, this type of stuff, you can just change the interpreter. You can make it, uh, make it work. All right, and let me just give you a little bit of a rundown um, of some of the extensions and some of the key points before we finish. So. Uh, one of the things we haven't done, and again, um, it's not necessarily stuff I'm expecting people to know about, we haven't conditioned distributions or observations or done what's known as Bayesian inference, and you can do that, but again, there's not a talk for statistics people, so I won't be going into that so, so much. But it's, it's in the code if you have a look. Um, another nice thing that we can get from this model, because we've separated out the interpreters, is we can then have composition of inference algorithms or interpreters, as we're calling them. And so you can build bigger algorithms out of smaller ones. That's quite a nice feature. Um, it's quite an active area of research, to be honest, at the moment. Um, distributing computation over cluster, something I talked about, you probably want to consider doing. And um, let me just say that uh, probabilistic programming is a very active area of research right now. Um, so if you uh, have some knowledge of the machine learning world, you've probably heard of deep learning, a very kind of hot area at the moment. Um, probabilistic programming is probably the other main area that's really active right now. So there, there are lots of people looking to this. And it's really interesting because you're finding machine learning people are meeting the, the programming languages people, and there's a, there's a lot to contribute from both sides. OK. So just wrap up with a few conclusions. Um, so the number one thing I want people to take away is that there is a monad for probability. If you have nothing else from this talk, take that away from it. There's a monad for probability, you can model probability distributions as monads. And that is the, the big idea here, the big idea behind prob probabilistic programming. Um, <clears throat> why this is interesting is because reducing the cost of probabilistic inference has many benefits. If you're identifying objects in deep space, for example, as some of us might be doing, there's work on uh, using your sparse data there to try and infer what's going on. That's a uh, probabilistic inference model. Um, gene sequence experiments are another one where people like to use this. And of course, we can't go away without mentioning. Targeting online ads pays for the internet we all know and love, as much as we may hate ads, um, again. So uh, a few words. In contrast to deep learning, which is assuming you don't have a great deal of knowledge of the problem, and you're just basically going to throw a lot of computing power and a lot of data at it, in probabilistic inference, we're assuming we can build, we have a lot of uh, prior knowledge, we can build a complex uh, model of what is going on, and we can then um, 
leverage, say, probabilistic programming to do inference for us. So, for example, if you're trying to detect objects you know, in deep space, we have very good models of how light propagates in a vacuum, etc., you know, emission spectrums and so on. And we can apply, we can put all that knowledge into a probabilistic model, which you can't do in a sort of deep learning setup, and then really leverage that knowledge to make use of very, very sparse data. Um, so there are a lot of benefits here. And it's something that's extremely relevant to us, functional programming people. A lot going on there. OK, finally, a um, bit of code for the examples. Up on there, it's just a, pro it's a project I've just been hacking around recently. The code is, at the moment, a little bit of a mess. But uh, that's the nature of the beast. Still very early going there. Do have a look. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. So uh, from uh, the two approaches of deep learning versus um, uh, mm -hmm. probabilistic modeling, like <clears throat> for predicting future events, like three, if I have three cats, does that mean I have a milkshake? Like, does there, is there any studies out there, like if I did a sparse distributed representation or a deep learning approach to that where I said I just did a, I have, I have a history of what three, two, and one cats meant, and I just throw that into a deep learning approach. Right. Has anybody done research on which approach will be more accurate, the deep learning versus the probabilistic modeling? Okay, for, for this type of model, the assuming my the model I generated is correct, which is like a really simple model and there's no way that it actually is correct, then um, the probabilistic programming approach would be more accurate by sort of definitionally because it's going to give me an exact answer. It's a, new, it's a discrete problem. I can enumerate all the possibilities. I can solve the model exactly. So um, it would be more accurate for this very simple setup. More generally, what can we look at the difference between the two? Um, deep learning works well when you have loads of data. Um, you don't have a good idea of the structure of, of the solution, but you have some idea. Um, people like to think of deep learning as though it's uh, sort of model-free, but it's, but it's not. I don't know if you're familiar with deep learning, but the way these convolution networks and so on are set up, they do have some kind of assumption on things like uh, local local interactions between units. You assume that if your one pixel is close to another pixel, then they often share information, things like that. So there's, there's an assumption of some structure there. But not a great deal of structure and not a, not a very clearly defined. So lots of data, um, little structure, and um, normally continuous domains works, works very well. Um, the probabilistic programming approach is more suitable when you have a lot of structure you know beforehand. You have sort of expert knowledge like we do in, say, the, you know, the galaxy example. You have, this, have very detailed physical models of light and so on, um, but not so much data. So you really need to, you're leaning a lot more on your prior knowledge, on the expert knowledge to construct this model, and you can then squeeze more use out of a uh, limited amount of data. So um, they're each appropriate in different domains. I mean, deep learning has been hot recently because it's doing stuff with vision and kind of very, firstly, things that make for great publications, you know, great pictures and demos and things, all this kind of deep learning stuff, or images and stuff people can relate to, and also solving problems that people have had um, difficulty with in the past. The things that where probabilistic programming, probabilistic inference are, are not as easy for people to relate to. Um, in this, and it's probably a slightly newer field as well. Okay. Uh, thanks, Neil. This is a great talk and a great topic. So, uh, uh, you know, I'm also very interested in um, machine learning with functional programming. I think they're perfectly suitable. And uh, I'd like to maybe do a, like an conference session tomorrow with you know everybody who's interested. So I think uh, I wonder what do you see as the key missing pieces in Scala ecosystem, right? So we have beautiful type type system we can build from primitives, right? But right. you know we want some libraries, and you know everybody kind of is learning machine learning and data mining in Python nowadays, right? So Python basically people are looking at, if we want to bring Python people onto Scala, what what are we missing? Like what should our focus be? 
<laughs> okay, that, that's an that's a interesting question and a really broad question. Um, so let me try to address it from a few different ways. So in terms of probabilistic programming, there's a lot of work at the moment on the semantics of probabilistic programming, what trans program transformations are valid, can you actually do that, maintain this, the semantics? And there, there's some open questions there. Um, there's also the... So that's, that's one area of active research, the area of research and inference algorithms and so on. That's all important. I but I think uh, the main thing that's um, holding people back right now is probably uh, more of an infrastructure engineering type of thing. So if you do have a large amount of data, and for I've said that probabilistic programming is, works well with less data, but you probably still have a fairly large amount of data. You might want to have some sort of Spark integration or something like that, so you can run these things over clusters and so on. Even if the data itself is not so big, there's still advantages in terms of... Um, failure recovery and so on for using some kind of framework like Spark. <clears throat> so that's one aspect, I think, is just uh, sort of infrastructure and so on. Um, then bringing Python people over, that's, you know, that's, that's a really interesting question. Um, I, I do a lot of Scala training, and I think there's a lot to be said in terms of how you present Scala and how you teach people, um, which I don't think we do a very good job of as a community at the moment. So that's setting one thing there. Um, now, Python and the scientific Python have a lot of tools there already, matrix computation there. I don't see them as being too relevant to this type of setting. Um, so I'm not sure that we, we need to have equivalent to those tools. So I think at least the ones we have are sufficient. Um, perhaps it's on the plotting angle, the sort of data, data analysis, or exploratory data analysis type of thing that uh, we need to get better. Because I think building a model like this, I presented as you just sort of write down the model and away you go, but actually you probably want to plot the data, chop it up, have a look at different bits and that. And that's where the Python tools are pretty good and the Scala ones are a little bit lacking. So it's, it's really there, I think, that we need to... Thanks, hope that... Okay, we have time for one more quick question. Okay. Yeah, you you mentioned that the Scala tools were a bit lacking. I just wanted to see if you could speak to what they are in your practice. Um, okay. So Python, they have uh, tools like Pandas. I, I think maybe one of them. So it's basically about representing your data um, in terms of sort of naming the different fields and being able to quickly uh, sort of chop it up the data by different field names. Um, get summaries of the data and so on. You can do a lot of this stuff with Spark, but Spark is a really heavy framework. It's using a hammer to crack a nut, or sort of more like using an anvil to crack a nut. Um, and, you know, most data sets don't really need this whole big data thingy, um, particularly when you're just exploring data to start with. So it would be, be better to have a, something that worked, um, something that's a little bit faster in the single machine case, and... Um, which is easier to sort of wrap around in. So, you know, Spark does have the Spark shell, but you've got this overhead of Spark there. It's not great. So that's the basic thing I have in mind. Yeah. And I think easy plotting as well is something that we don't have so much. So another okay, uh, then let's thank Noel for his talk. <laughs>